Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Julie Vadnell. I am deputy editor at Domino Magazine, and I am thrilled to be speaking with all of you tonight. But I don't think everyone knows who you are, so I'd love it if you could all just introduce yourselves, tell us what you do at Anthropology, and how long you've done it for. Hi, everyone. I'm Carolyn Keir. I'm the Senior Creative Director of Print and Brand. I've been with Anthro for 20 years. I'm Nikki Ayer. Um, I'm the Display Manager at the Home Office that oversees Windows, and I have been with this company for 12 years. I'm Erica Lavinia. I am the Senior Display Director at the Home Office, and I have been here for 20 years. Hi, I'm Lance Wynn. I'm the Senior Visual Director for Home Office, and I've been here 26 years. Hi, I'm Alex Quintana. I'm a lead senior display coordinator. Um, I've been with the company for 11 years, and I oversee displays in um, New York and uh, New England. I'm Nina Lee. I'm the senior display coordinator at Rock Center, and I've been with the company for 12 years. Did anyone do the math of how many years that is? Because <laughs> if you did and you get it right, someone will give you an anthropology gift card. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we have a lot of students here tonight, so I want to hear from each of you what you studied in school, because we know where you ended up, but where did you start? So we should start at the other end. This let's time. Go, yeah, All let's right, start at the end. Let's start with Nina. <laughs> um, so I studied painting at Pratt Institute. I got my BFA in 2012, and I've been working for Anthro ever since. And I did my first year at Museum School of Fine Arts in Boston and then transfer to uh, MassArt and finish off my bachelor's there. And I kind of took a little bit of everything, which is what drew me to museum school. Um, so I didn't really have a focus, which ended up being perfect for anthropology because I end up just doing a little bit of everything now. <laughs> and you do it very well. Um, I, I went to University of the Arts in Philadelphia, uh, and I graduated with a BFA in photography. Um, and I did uh, printmaking and textiles most of my career there, but fell in love with photography. Um, I started off as a painting major and then decided that I needed something that I knew I would make money at, and so I went into graphic design, and then I really missed painting, so I did both. And then I was introduced to photography, and I was like, this is great too, and so I minored in photography, and I came out like as a jumbled mass of just all things that I loved, so it's pretty cool. Um, I was a sculpture major at Wesleyan University. I went to a small state school in Pennsylvania called Kutztown, and just like Erica, um, I was told when I was 17 that I could make money being an artist, being a graphic designer, so that was it. That was it for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool, you guys all have very diverse backgrounds, however, all art focused. Um, I want to talk about some of the things that we are seeing in this room, some of the things that we see in the stores, because you are all responsible for them. And one of the mottos at Anthropology is from the ordinary to the extraordinary. And so I want to know how you, this team goes from a simple idea and turns it into something beautiful, maybe something we're seeing in this room or that we would see in a store or in a window. How does that creative process work? Um, it's a process that has a lot of different phases. It's also pretty long. Um, so our stores right now are going to install their holiday windows in about two weeks. And we started concepting for this holiday about a year plus ago. And so it's, it's a lengthy process, but what that gives us is a lot of time to play along the way. So it starts with just a concept, which is, um, you know, being a creative person, looking around, like what's interesting, what seems like it's on trend right now, reading, looking at, at imagery, and just kind of like gathering a lot of inspiration from all different categories and areas, and pulling that together into something that feels like a story or an idea that we want to share with our customers. And we start with that, and once we feel really, really good with that, we start our prototype process. And I'm going to pass it off to Nikki, and she can kind of walk you through a little bit of what that looks like. 
Um, so sort of as a team, we really delve into what the concept is. Um, you know, we present to our higher ups and get to sign off on it. And then we sort of work internally pulling more inspiration that's a little bit more tied to the logistics and the creative process of how we would actually execute this concept and bring it to life. Um, and then how are we going to communicate that to the stores as well? Um, so being at the office, once we go through this concepting process, I will then take sort of all of our imagery all of our ideas, have some kind of uh, thoughts on techniques and material palette, and we'll have a material testing proto in which we pull in um, really high talent from the field, like Nina, like Alex, um, and we get to sort of just mess around with these techniques with different unexpected materials. I think that's a little bit of where the ordinary to extraordinary comes in as well. Um, and there's a lot of discovery, there's a lot of failure, um, but there's always something that we can learn from everything that we try, whether or not it makes an appearance in the current season or within this current concept. Um, post to that, I will do renderings that show sort of how fully realized this concept could be in different iterations and different store spaces. All our store windows are very different. Um, and then once we have gone through that, we will have a two week proto in which again, we pull in um, a team of our top talent and we will fully execute one to three scenarios that could have could be full windows um, so that we are able to fully vet all of our techniques, our compositions, sort of like how all of our display elements are working together. And from there, we it is on us to um, figure out how to communicate the way that all stores will be executing that. And so from there, it goes to Alex. <laughs> and then, Beautiful transition. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. And then I take the home office direction and filter it through the field, so all the stores. Um, for me in particular, New England and New York. Um, our stores are kind of tiered, so we have like stores that just follow straight prototype, which is like the majority of them, and then there's some like high profile stores like Renina's and uh, Rock Center um, that they take what has been done at home office and then just we just keep going with it. We just take the baton and keep running as far as we can until maybe it gets too much <laughs> and then we pull back a little bit. But um, yeah, we just um, take it there. Yeah, um, I work super closely with Alex to try and just make sure that the displays in our store, in Rock Center specifically, are specific to New York City and our customer and relevant to everyone that walks through those doors and just we try to elevate the prototype to the highest point possible so that it makes sense for you know, our, cus our New York City customer, specifically like this taxi. Um, we, had, we had a version of this in our holiday windows a few years ago and it was spread across three windows and it was just really lovely and such like great customer reaction to that be being such like a New York City specific element. It was a concept that was all about if animals were the UPS of this season and they were the ones who were delivering all your presents, what would that look like? And so in New York, it was it a, taxi a taxi <laughs> filled with animals all carrying gifts to deliver for the season. So I true, think it's true on, New York City charm. Yeah. I think it's on page 214 of the book. <laughs> we'll get to the book. <laughs> if you all want to reference it. Um, and I, you got, before you arrived, Nikki was making final touches to that taxi. So that shows you how deeply invested you guys are in the way everything looks at an anthropology event and store. Oh, the windows are a constant upkeep, depending on what the materials are, how hot it gets in the window. Yeah. How much sunshine. How much sun hits the window. How much yeah. customer interaction <laughs> wants to go into the window. <laughs> Speaking of that, we have a funny story about uh, customer interaction. There was a window from a long time ago that was all marshmallows just strung on lines. And one of my favorite like, story moments from that time was we had a, a coworker who was with the company at the time and she had just finished this window and it was you know, thousands of marshmallows that had been hand strung. And she was standing outside to look at her window that she had just completed and like two kids with their hands up in the air just ran through the whole window and everything got tangled up and it was like crazy. And then you're just like, and there's my next week is just gonna be detangling. But uh, kids love our displays from our animals to our, you know, our food inspired moments. But 
it is when you know that you've done a, a great display. They'll hug the animals. Maybe our animals aren't meant to be as huggable as your dog at home. <laughs> They're card filled with cardboard and bubble wrap and things like that. But it's so cute to see the smiles on their faces. They're like, okay, we did a good job. Yeah. We did a good job. They're happy. Maybe we just untangle for another week. Not, not, <laughs> not, so, not so great there, but that's okay. I think the smile is sort of our, our goal. You know, yeah. kids and adults alike, if we can bring a smile to their face, we've, you know, we've succeeded, so. Wait, what is the strangest material you've ever worked with? To date. Is, and is it in this room? <laughs> well, candy, I think that we've gotten a lot of mileage out of candy, and I think the way I've done, I've done store openings, I've done hundreds of our store openings, but what I like seeing the display coordinators do or do is just go shop the stores. Like, I remember the marshmallow window was like, People, someone was in the grocery store just like, ah, oh, marshmallows. We haven't used those before. Let's buy everything that, that Acme has. And we bought every single bag just to kind of play with. But it's just literally going to shop stores to see what they have to make something into. And that's that sort of ordinary to extraordinary. Because um, one of my favorite things was to walk an office supply store. Because I would just be like, this is something so generic that no one sees anything amazing in. What can we do with it? Like, we have our flowers over there are made out of twist ties. And we also have a dog over there that's made out of twist ties. So we can also take the same material and be like, like what different things can we do with it that really show the versatility and, and the potential within this well beyond what a customer might naturally think of using it for. So you guys are in a very creative field. I know what that's like. And uh, students also know what this is like to get feedback. So I want to hear a little bit about how you give each other feedback how that works at anthropology and maybe make students feel better about getting constant feedback and know that it's not so bad all the time. I can take that one. Go for it. Because I give a lot of feedback, which, which they, definitely, they definitely feel. But the one, our perspective is there is no, there is no failure. It's, it, it only makes the next thing better. So we actually really enjoy feedback. And sometimes it's, you haven't pushed it far enough that like we want you to go even further, like with someone as talented as, as Nina, where like you can just you can just run with it, just do whatever you want. You're so talented, just push, push, push. And sometimes you've tried something that's absolutely awful, but you've at least tried. And we know that for everybody, we won't do that again, right? Great, we won't play with this material, or that color looks horrible in our stores, or whatever. But it's never a failure. It's always just keep trying, keep trying. It might inspire another season. It might inspire another display. It might inspire somebody else. Um, or we might just tell us that we should never do that again, and that's fine too. <laughs> but we've learned and we moved on, but it's always like a, a happy kind of place. I think, Alex, you might have more to add to this too, because this is a lot of what your job is, is Yeah, feedback. I write a lot of feedback emails. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and usually it's never really anything major for the, my, com like my communication with the field. It's a lot of like, oh, like, have you taken this in your space? Like, the color looks a little off try punching it up, or usually it's a lot of composition. We have a lot of like organic compositions in our displays, and that's not always like anyone's, or most people's like immediately, like their strong suit. Um, so it's a lot of just like tweaking and adjusting, and you're kind of, from my perspective, we're just kind of like guardrails that are just like tapping back and forth and making sure our artists are kind of, you know, in the straight and narrow and keeping them keeping them in line, but um, so, yeah. <laughs> you probably know better from my feedback as I have to. I think too that um, all of our feedback is so incredibly collaborative. Um, I know that Julie has spoken to a couple of people about this as well, that everything we do here is not the work of a single person. Um, it's not only the brainchild of an entire team, but there are so many hands that have touched it, and we are relying on so many people's eyes and expertise and experience um, to make these things come to life. So I think that whenever we're giving feedback, it's really more of like a peer-to-peer -peer thing and it's a discussion and it's a way to sort of like spark ideas in other people that you maybe never would have thought of um, and so and I think you know we're all not only working as a team but we're working towards like a team goal and for that reason it's not about anyone's individual vision we're creating this vision together as we create the display. When I first came to the office and we were sort of dabbling with a new um, prototyping process for windows. And I remember I had a team that was going to start working on a window. And I hadn't had my first like 
conversation with them yet. And I sat down and I sketched out thoughts for what I thought each of them should accomplish. I was like, they're gonna make this sketch and they're gonna make this sketch. And then I had a call with them where I was saying like, well, why don't you sketch out some things and bring them back and we'll look at them together. And they came back and every single one of them was better than what I had sketched because I was trying to solve everyone's problems where they were able to hone in on just their one challenge and really pick it apart. And it was that moment of, of realizing like, oh, it, it's not a team of one. Like, I don't have to solve everything. I can really rely on partners and the creativity that we have in this company all around us and we can work together to get these really amazing places. And our proto process, like you were saying when we go through it, new people are coming each time. And I think it's amazing when we can give a project that someone has worked on and then we can pass it off to a new person because one person was a photographer and one person was a sculptor and one person was a painter. They're all gonna have that tweaked perspective or talent to bring to the plate that's gonna continue to push it better and better. And that's why we allow ourselves to have such a long prototyping process. We don't work on something one time and say like, and that's gonna be the best it can be. We let it go through different phases so it continues to get pushed further and further. So that by the time we're passing it off to Alex and Nina um, in the stores to even push it further beyond that, we know it's just gonna be incredible. Yeah, something I love so much about partnering with Alex is that we do, we do have a pin board that is just safe space. <laughs> so no bad ideas, throw anything out there. This is a safe space for us to communicate any crazy things that we might not end up using, but it always sparks some kind of interesting conversation that might lead to you know, something that we hadn't expected before. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and it's nice to just for like I love feedback because sometimes like when there's projects and like if it's a big installation or something, I mean you're just in it for hours at a time and you've just gone blind to like what it even looks like at, by the end of the day, and it's just nice to have someone else's eyes to to just give you like an initial thought, an initial like this is what I'm seeing, and it's not your own head, you know. Do you guys have creative guidelines or things that you know? this is anthropology, this is not anthropology, or is it just a free-for-all of creative ideas? I could take some part of it. Maybe Erica, you want to take part of it. I would say when we, when we started, we definitely had particular, we were very, or, sorry, we were very particular. Like there were certain materials we would never have used a plastic, plastic material, it wasn't anthropology. It had to be touched, a material had to be touched and worn and weathered a certain amount of time before the customer could see it or before it came onto the floor. And as we grew and changed and apparel and the product modernized, we kind of modernized as well. And I know Erica would then take it and like, can we use this material now? Okay, yeah, why not? Or like, so now kind of anything goes, but we try to get a mixture of things. So there's not really a rule, but we'll definitely have a guideline as to what works and what doesn't work and what looks good in our stores in our windows. And I actually love to almost see it as like the reverse challenge now, which is like, all right, let's prove that 99% of the materials out there could be anthropology appropriate if we do the right thing to it. And this lady is queen of that. I mean, the things that she'll bring into a testing process where you're just like, if anyone else was trying to use this right now, I would be like, nope, don't even start. Let, let's not go there. And, She'll do amazing things with it where all of a sudden you're like, of course that's going to be in an anthropology window. I mean, to Erica's point earlier, one of my favorite things to do is to go in specifically to Home Depot and like walk the plumbing section, walk the hardware section, see what kind of, um, you know, unexpected, really niche, peculiar kind of hard, like construction material we can use. But I think that like, a general sort of rule of thumb for me, no matter what the material is, because I do love this challenge of being like, I'm gonna bring in a material that Erica I know is gonna feel at best medium about, but I'm gonna prove to her that we can use it, um, is that we still have to preserve the touch of hand. Like we want everything to look like an artist made it, um, not like it was manufactured in mass. And so I think that that's something that we always keep in the back of our head, no matter how synthetic or you know unexpected a material might be. I think some. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I think sometimes it's it's about what you can do with the material, and I think sometimes what the teams have done really great is like it's not about necessarily the material. It's about the okay. Well, one of this is okay, but if I had 500 of these, like the paintbrushes, or we've done wine bottles or things we've collected, it's 
the material might just be not manipulated at all. It might be about the quantity that all of a sudden becomes, becomes a beautiful thing that you've done, you've still tweaked and changed, but yeah. it's about the mass of the product, yeah. the mass of the item. I would say too, also, if you want to think about a rule, this is like a playful rule that we have, but it's like, what's the anthropology twist? And like, you know, we can take an idea that's classic, like a flower for spring, but how do we make it feel like it's specialized and unique to how anthropology would represent that flower or be inspired by a flower? And so, you know, that might be like we're throwing in a wacky color or a crazy material or the scale is like, insane compared to the real and so we talk a lot about like are we being too real like where do we get that playfulness where do we get that that twist on something that makes it feel like we've really had fun with it above and beyond like what the normal is we had a a good conversation with our founder and she described us as a brand in a way that really has stuck with Lance and I since then and it's she's like you are all about the fantasy like you are about taking your customer and transporting her to a different place when she walks in your stores and I think that's such a good goal for us to always have no matter what we're making. So if we feel like we've brought her to that place where all of a sudden she's not seeing a zebra that's black and white, she's seeing a zebra that's, you know, covered in prints from our product through the last, you know, 30 years. That's, there's something special about that and how we've interpreted it. I've heard it referred to in some of the merchants, they always, we always come to the little wink, which I also appreciate that that's the rule. The rule is like something whimsical or like, it's like funny, like I look at the animals, uh, great, it's a group of dogs that are all handmade that are beautiful, but then there's still the, the littlest mouse, which I've missed like three times <laughs> walking by, and this is my team doing it. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so cute. Just the little details that just take it just a little bit further and just make you smile. Like smile factor is a big um, rule, if you will, for, our, for what we do. We just want to make the customer smile, and also we want to engage our display coordinators and ourselves, so if we're all happy, you can tell in the work. If we're not loving what we're doing, you can kind of tell that too. It's like a... Uh, it doesn't feel so good. In magazines, we called it sparkle. <laughs> we called it whizzle. Whizzle for a little while. Whizzle and sparkle. I feel like we would get along. I, we would. Let's start a magazine. I heard print is just doing great right now. Um, when you look back, and a lot of you have worked at Anthropology for a very long time, is there a particular project that you're most proud of? Well, Nina, I'm going to pass it to you in a minute, but Nina and I were talking earlier about her favorite, and it's actually one of my favorites, too. But I'm going to talk about one other one first before I pass it to you, and that's um, our Earth Day windows, so that's more of a general favorite. But um, we've been doing Earth Day windows now for about 12 to 13 years, and it's a sort of a project that I started a while ago when I first came to the office, and um, I'm just a a pretty environmental person in my own personal life and I was reading articles and just had this moment of wondering if we could challenge our brand to be more. And I came in and at the time I, I went, nervously went up to my two bosses and I said, you know, do you think we could do a window that was inspired by something that needs to be a focus in the environment? And we ended up um, focusing on the, the bee for our first um, Earth Day window. And my whole thought was, the bee is so small, but what they bring to the earth is huge. And we are a big brand. Can we give this little bee a larger voice? Can we help our customer to understand the plight of the bee and what she can do to help? So could we end up in this situation where our windows get to be more. They get to actually not just inspire and be beautiful, but actually educate and motivate you know, our customers to become a part of something that's really important. And so those are some of my, I think, my proudest moments outside of that and inspiring this lovely taxi we have over here is our, this was inspired by a gingerbread window that we did in 2015. And it was one of my favorite material testing moments because um, I was about to go on maternity leave with my son and we had this amazing group who was gonna test and I gave everyone an assignment. I was like, you have to come up with as many different ways as possible to make something look like gingerbread cookie. You're on frosting duty. I want whipped frosting and a glaze and like all these different types of faux frost. You know, and so everyone had their little project that was all just about transforming the food world in, within the anthropology brand. And so it was just such a fun window to explore. Um, and then it was one of the first moments that I worked with this lovely lady on a prototype. And she made a pink beetle 
that was almost life-sized, all out of faux gingerbread. Um, now, a Volkswagen Beetle, not an insect. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh yes, I, I should clarify. Yes. Um, and then we have, you know, almost eight years later, she's been piping for days on this taxi over here. But it was also a moment. It was one of my favorite windows when it came to stores interpreting. So. Nina, now I'm going to pass it off to you. So, yes, um, our holiday windows 2020, when we had the stretch taxi in our windows with all the animals and everything, um, every year the tree at Rock Center is delivered. And that year we discovered, well, the people that put up the tree discovered <laughs> a tiny owl that had been living in the tree. And so this was after windows had been due. We'd taken final photos. Everyone had signed off on it. And my team and I decided, no, we really need to add this special element to these windows. <laughs> so we spent a half a day. We made a tiny little owl that was a recreation of the owl that they found in the tree across the street from our windows. And it was wrapped in like a pink was... <laughs> terry cloth. Like, little baby. A little, someone had like wrapped a little sweater around it. Um, we recreated it and everyone had so much fun parading it through the store, <laughs> bringing it to the windows, placing it in the tree and everyone, and I mean like my team and I, cheered, <laughs> cheered for this tiny little owl that was so special for those holiday windows and so just like relevant for what was happening at the time. Well, it was I, joy. That story got passed to the home office and then it was like, there was not a person who heard that who didn't just smile. Like it was like we all needed that little moment of like just true love and joy and fun and art in the store. Yeah, it, it wasn't required, it was, but it was necessary for us. <laughs> I think you guys need a reality show because I would watch that. Like, I would watch. Um, Anthropology has a big birthday this year, and to celebrate that, there's this gorgeous book. And when you've worked at a place so long and worked on so many projects, I'm wondering how you distill all of that into one book and how you choose what goes into it. So, yes, yeah, so Anthro turns 30 this year, um, and uh, <clears throat> Elizabeth. Uh, who's the planner, I always wait to the last minute. <clears throat> she's the planner, so last April, she's like, I think we should like plan what we're gonna do for the anniversary. And uh, URBN, Urban Outfitters, um, our parent company, turned 50, and they did this sort of online um, look back through the years. And we discovered that we had so many photos of every store opening and all of these things that archives that I didn't know existed no, nobody knew existed. And so as we were started to go through all of these, I was like, we have way more photos than we could ever possibly do. So I think we have over a half a million photos. So the book did not become a collection, it became an elimination. So it was basically like, what can we take out of the book and not have to, you know, so it's 288 pages. And so some things had to go. And, um, and it was amazing to me when you get, look at the amount of talent and art and amazing things that have been made in our, um, over the years, and you'll see through the book. Um, it's quite astounding to, that I get to work with them every day. So this was a labor of love for me to show like how, what they do every day and how they do it. So um, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, it's really special and really fun to look through. I got sucked in this afternoon. I was like, I need to leave. Um, I, we are going to open up the floor for questions, so I'm, but I'm gonna throw you guys one that we didn't prepare, so sorry. Um, that gives you a second to prepare. But okay, so we've looked back at the past 30 years. What's the thing you're dying to do next? Like what material do you wanna work with that you haven't worked with next? Or what idea do you wanna put forward next? I can, I'll, I'll start for the group. I think that's the, the fun part. Um, I know we just met um, Nikki, Erica, myself, Julie, and Tracy about holiday next year. Like, we're, what are, what are we going to be next year? This year we are doing this. But what is next year going to be? And sometimes we would be like, we want to be glitzy, then we want to be color, or back and forth between white and color. So it was so much fun to just sit down and be like, 
we've done that, or that feels like old anthro, and that doesn't feel good. Like, what's the new material? But I love the brainstorm process. I love that we want to keep evolving to something we haven't seen that, or worth talking like next year. No animals. No, we're in penguins in the in the window this year. Something different. It's got to be something that we've never done before. Actually, I'm more excited about the process, the process of something that we've never seen in terms of just the way we're all working together. And I think Alex said it. We're throwing ideas out that maybe nobody. There's no bad idea. We're like just to kind of spark conversation. I'm like this. Is, I'm always like this is a horrible idea, but just 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 take a look at it, hoping that the girls will then take it somewhere amazing, which they always. And by the way, they always say they're not going to do animals, and there's always animals. <laughs> there will always be animals. <laughs> we love animals. They're the best. Yeah, look around. There's animals everywhere. Our brand that loves animals. <laughs> um, amazing. Thank you, guys. Did anyone else have anything to add? All right, we're going to open it up to you guys. Raise your hand. We have someone passing around a mic in the back there. Hi, absolutely lovely display. It's been, I'm a student here, it's been wonderful watching it go up over the week. Some beautiful things. But very quickly, you've mentioned, all of you have talked about your backgrounds, you know, fine arts training, you know, painting, sculpting, um, also graphic arts, etc. What are you looking for in people that are going to be successful in anthropology? What is the ideal candidate? What are you, is it a set of skills? Is it, you know, uh, vision? I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you bring people into the fold? How does that work? We'll, we'll, we'll share this sure, one. Sure, go for it. Like, well, we, st well, we always started looking for display coordinators. It was never like they had to fit one, they never needed one skill, but we wanted all of the display coordinators from around the country to have all of the skills. You just need to be artistic. We, you know, like two years at an art school, but I had, I, I could work with wood to save my life when I was hired as a display coordinator. It was awful, and I, but my sewing was okay, but I had a photography background, which has nothing to do with what, I, what I'm doing whatsoever, but I had a vision. So I, I could see the store in a certain way and see the, the display in a certain way, and I was hired for that, but it had nothing to do with my, my role. It was how I could see something, but then somebody else would be hired for a completely different reason. Um, I, I think it's like comfort in problem solving, like, every single day we're constantly being challenged to solve creative problems so if someone is comfortable in that world i think that's like so so important and just like whenever we're talking about someone new that we've gotten to work with that we love it's someone who's just is energetic they want to learn i i loved art school i learned so much in art school i've probably learned 75,000 times that much working for anthropology because it's like a new challenge every single day. And we're just like, what do we want to figure out? Like, how do we want to challenge ourselves? What do we want to play with? And so I think just someone who is excited to play and learn and, you know, discover is like really, really motivating for us to work with. And then this Curiosity. is... Curiosity. Can I tell? This is a Lance. Sorry, Lance. Okay. This is a Lance story I'm going to throw in. He was like, I didn't know how to cut wood, but I could sew. But he was a problem solver because very early on, Lance was challenged to cut out circles out of wood, and he didn't know how to do it. And he cut one, and it was really not great, and he brought it in, and his boss was like, that's not good enough, go do it again. So he cut another one, brought it in, that's not, do, not, that's not good enough, do it again. So then he walked down the street and found a construction worker, and he paid him <laughs> to cut a wonderful circle, and he brought it back. Problem solving. They were happy with that, yes. I was just like, I can't. You're, so, you're asking the wrong person, I can't do this. Creative problem solving, I do feel what we do. Like, this is the perfect jumping off story. Um, so I started with the company as an intern in college, and I will back up what Erica said, that you know I learned a lot in sculpture uh, in school, but I learned a million times more working under the display artist who hired me. Um, and I think that like aside from a, aside from a desire to learn, I think that the responsibility is also on us as a team to provide training in the communication that we give. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's like, complete these courses, check these skills off. Um, I don't need you to have those coming in. I think something that I feel incredibly passionate about is that we can magnify the skills you come with, but we can teach you skills that you don't know. And so to this point about Lance and cutting a circle, when I got to the office, uh, whenever we would have stores cut a circle, we were still asking them to do it by hand with a jigsaw. 
Um, and so I decided that because all stores were going to get money to have a router, I was going to make a video and a how-to on how to make a circle jig for said router so everyone can cut a perfect circle, whether or not you um, consider yourself a woodworker. Um, so thank I think you, that you. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, I think that that's something that we can bring to the field and the field can meet us halfway. Um, and so I think that, you know, when I was hiring interns and assistants in stores, I was looking for somebody who was curious, who wanted to learn, and who had a good eye above a really strong or like broad skill set. My other anecdote about what you know and don't know when you come to anthropology is I started 20 years ago, so you couldn't watch a YouTube video to like learn how to do something. And it was my first week on the job and I had to sew something with a sewing machine. And I was like, I know how to use a sewing machine and I was working. And then um, the bobbin ran out of thread. And I was like, got it, I know how to use a sewing machine but I don't know how to wind a bobbin with thread. So I just like very like calmly shut the art room door and then I took out the bobbin and I took out the thread and then I hand wound <laughs> that bobbin. And then I called my mom that night and I was like, I'm coming home this weekend and you're gonna teach me how to sew. <laughs> but in that moment, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna solve this the way I can and it's gonna be fine. And then I'm gonna go learn. And so, you know, it's just constant learning. I love that answer. Anyone else? <laughs> we, we have a crew in the field that's making sure that everything looks great, but I mean, I have to give credit to this team here because they work really hard to create beautiful things. They work just as hard to make sure that it's communicated in a way that everyone can be successful, and that's a lot of work, um, but they, like, they truly don't feel like they're doing their job unless they can see something that's at the same caliber everywhere. But you're also not going to see the perfect exact same thing as this because it's going to be interpreted by each artist. We have artists in our stores. It's amazing. In the, for the most, I mean, it depends a little bit now. Um, we used to just be everything was starting from scratch and now we sort of balance. Like what we try to do now is um, if something is made out of, to Lance's earlier point, like five million of something, we might send you know, the paper cut out five million butterflies, but then, we're, then we let them be the artist. We're like, you're gonna treat it. You're gonna fold it into its origami shape. You're going to, you know, sew it and thread it and install it in a beautiful way. We've just made it so you don't have to hand cut out five million butterflies. I was gonna say, sometimes it's exciting to see what they do, because t thinking back to the taxi cab window that um, this group did in Rock Center, that was such a treat to see. But on the flip side, how they deliver mail in Al Moana was by Stingray. And that was just as a surprise. We're like, oh, they took it under the water. This is genius. So, so that, that store took it completely the opposite direction from a taxi cab. They were delivering mail by Stingray, which was like so clever. We're like, that's genius. But we celebrate them. We celebrate those artists in those markets because it's exciting. And I think this is too where Eric's excuse me, where Alex's tier of people come in as well. Um, you know, he knows each of the display artists in the stores that he oversees, and he knows who he can push and who he needs to maybe help and needs to encourage to follow direction more closely. Um, and so I have to, like, credit his management and his, um, his partners as well, their management of the field, which is a lot of the reason why you're seeing um, such consistency and such a high level of execution across the board. Yeah, there's a team of five of us that oversee all of the um, stores and we see <laughs> a lot of photos every week from every single store, where they're at during the week, process shots, how they're doing, what they did that week. And um, yeah, we just sort of have eyes on it, the whole process from when they're sketching their own windows to when it's fully installed and we keep tabs on it and yeah.
I know that most of what we've been talking about is window displays, but I'm curious, Carolyn, if you could tell us more about your team and other creative ways that people can have a career at anthropology outside of window displays. Thanks. Okay. What, was, what was the first part of that? <laughs> Well, we've just been focusing mostly on the window displays, uh, yeah. and I know you have such an amazing team, and there's lots of other ways that pe the creatives can contribute to our brand. So could you talk so, a little bit about that? So the building, our, our home office is just, it's, it's department after department of amazingly talented creative people. So um, just actually being in the building is pretty amazing. Um, my, my designers are, are here. Uh, raise your hands, yay! Um, and uh, we, we take a lot of our cues for um, all the signage in the store and invitations and things that we make um, from the visual team. So. They do their execution, they make us a pack, and then we take that, and then we make our own, uh, own art from that. Um, and um, we, have, um, we have sort of like our things that we take from them um, throughout. Um, what else do you want to, what, what would you want to? <laughs> I, I was just gonna say like yeah. collaboration okay. is, is crazy between our two departments yeah. and those zebras are a perfect example of that because they um, represent this concept we did a few years ago called 52 Conversations, which basically any print that's like a repetition at Anthropology, we call a conversational print. It might be a blouse that's all like my little next telephones book. or <laughs> you know, um, a shirt that has dogs on it. Or, so it's a repetition of a print. And so we picked the 52 most iconic favorite prints from Anthropology's history and they became a collection where they, they remade the, those apparel pieces and sold them again. And at the same time, Carolyn's team turned that into this beautiful collection of bags. And um, it was, so it was a celebration in our product, it was a celebration in the bags that our customers could get in the stores, and then we took those bags and we cut them up and we covered a zebra in them. So really it's like we can be inspired by product, we can be inspired by design, vice versa, but it's a fun environment to play off of what else is happening around us. So um, making it by hand is, is something that I always try to do with everything. And even though we work on the computer and we work in Photoshop, but actually starting with something, an actual real thing, and make it by hand and make it for reals. And um, a lot of the, the stuff that graphic designers do now they never print it out, they never really see it, they don't touch it, they don't feel it, and um, so I encourage my team all the time to actually make things, and um, so we actually made some tote bags uh, that went with the books um, that were leftover banners from our store, signage in the stores, and my team, we, we painted over them, and um, then we had, um, our printer's wife sew them, <laughs> and she sewed 150 of them for us. And so there's like a, just a natural, uh, oh, and the handles are made from old bags as well. So it's all a reuse, and it's all touched, and it's all um, handmade, which you can feel it, I think. So. I just have to say that I, first off, adore Carolyn and her team, um, but I have such an appreciation for her love of doing tactile things and making them real. I think that that's where there's a lot of crossover and it makes the collaboration between us um, so much fun. And um, I think that we also will just have these really casual, like over a smoke break conversations <laughs> about like what material are we thinking about for holiday 2023? And like, there's definitely been some fun little brain children that have come of that as well. There was a moment, um, Julie, this was maybe like last Wednesday or Thursday, and we were in like the last week of making everything before it was gonna come here. And we weren't sure what we were gonna put our dogs on. And we were like, they need to be on like different levels and you know, pedestals, how are we gonna display them in the, in the gallery? And Carolyn came in from like nowhere and I was like, Carolyn, we don't know what to put our dogs on. And she's like, you should put them on rolled up cardboard. It'd be like, cardboard makes cardboard dogs. And I was just like, yes, that's it, that's it. We ordered it that day from Uline, it arrived the day after and we have our, our you know, perfect risers to show all of our dogs on. But So I think I get to keep one of those. <laughs> that, that's how that works? Yes, that's yeah. definitely how that works, uh -huh. yes. Maybe one last question? Oh, two, we'll do both. Okay. 
I was just wondering what you do with all the things you create after the window is finished. Okay. Do you keep them all? I love this question. Them? Yeah. Um, I love this question. Okay. So um, a, a few different things. Um, we have some members of the Nature Conservancy here today, um, and they represent our nonprofit partner right now. And so um, they're an example of, of one way that we are very thoughtful about what happens with our displays afterwards, and that is that we um, allow them to be adopted. And so they can be adopted by customers, and they will donate to our nonprofit partner at the time. And so, um, for example, some of our holiday displays, which you will see soon, are all going to be available to be adopted at the end of the season, and all of, all of the proceeds will go to the Nature Conservancy. So we're able to make sure nothing ends up in the trash. We're also able to make sure that you know, money goes to support a really good cause. Um, we also donate displays to um, community organizations, so um, hospitals, libraries, schools, things like that, and trying to make sure um, as much as is possible, everything ends up with a second or third life after anthropology. Um, we also just started letting things live in our stores a lot longer. Sometimes we're like, this is so good, it doesn't have to go anywhere anytime soon. We've had a lot of conversations where before, years ago, the whale might only be a spring or a summer thing, but like whales clearly live all year long. They, they don't go away in the fall. Why can't he live in the dining room back here? So we keep sculpture around as long as possible, as long as it still feels relevant in, in a store. And maybe if it feels tired in one store to us, we might move it to another store. So we, we might move it somewhere just so they can enjoy it. They didn't have a whale, so they, they can have it for a little we'll trade. So we try to keep them alive and, and moving for as long as possible? Other ways that um, we've been thoughtful, especially this past year, um, our partnership with the Nature Conservancy started with our Earth Day windows this past year, which were a celebration of sunflowers and um, everything that they do in an incredible way for the environment and the um, pollinator superhero that they are for our bees and our butterflies and our hummingbirds, et cetera. Um, and we made our sunflowers out of um, natural dyed seed paper. So at the end of the window display, when they were coming down, all that seed paper was packaged up by each store and sent to a plethora of different um, gardens throughout the country that the Nature Conservancy um, found for us. And so the plan is that they were planted and you'll see future pollinator gardens around the country to support those pollinators that started as a flower in our anthropology window. So again, making sure that there's that thoughtfulness um, with what happens after it's had its time in our stores. Okay, one last question in the front. Uh, yes, uh, actually two. <laughs> <laughs> A million photos, whatever. How many ended up in the book? And uh, having all your work immortalized in a book, what does that feel like? I think there's over, over a thousand photos. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, over a thousand. And, and I think I bought seven copies like yesterday of the book because I was very, it's like I want my, my, my family to have them. I'm just so excited to give them to like friends and family. It's amazing. I was like, oh my, when, when did that happen? I was like, oh, that was in Huntington Beach. Oh, that was in London. I was like, just even remembering when, they, when all the images were taken. Did you expect this love letter to the work you guys do? Well, my dad did. <laughs> like, I, t I told him we were doing a book, and he's like, I said that like 15 years ago. Like, this is my idea. <laughs> so he's known it should have always happened. But yeah, so he's, he's the... The book I bought is, is for him already. And I think going through the pictures with, with Carolyn was kind of fun because there's definitely the pre-digital days of <laughs> sifting through real just boxes of pictures that we don't want to throw away, but they're really awful, awful <laughs> pictures of just <laughs> with the point and shoots where no depth of field. It's just, oh, we were just like, oh, is this good? Is this bad? Can you print with this? And just, but there's so much charm in them because it's, you know, mm -hmm. in the, the, the mid nineties, just the pictures were great. There's also moments where like, I, I found a photo that was from when I was in the Boston store 20 years ago, and it was of this cloth mannequin that was dressed in a pretty pink dress, and I made fairy wings for her out of branches <laughs> and fabric, 
and like little ribbons. And I looked at it and I was like, they let me put this out there? <laughs> That's okay, I worked in the Soho store as a display coordinator and I flew a mannequin, I attached her to the lights and she was fine. I'm like, I should be here 26 years later. This is, this is an amazing thing, but I still have the photograph and I shared it. That didn't make the book. So talking didn't make about- my review. Talking about how our communication has evolved, and these guys are so good at communicating in such an amazing way to stores now, how to do everything that we do. But way back when, you would get a black and white fax that would say something like, who doesn't love a moss ball? Have fun. And you were like, what? Do something big. That do was my first big. window in Soho, was do something big. I'm like, big with what? <laughs> with paint? I made big fairy wings. Yeah. My, my first week, we had a sale for furniture, and they said, we want you to um, have a piece of upholstered furniture in the front of your store that you can paint white, and then you paint sale and red all over it, over and over and over again. And I was like four days in, and I was and like- you have no money. Yeah, and I was like, okay, so I don't, like, how do I, how do, I do that? And they're like, we're actually out of budget for the month, so, um, you know, there's that. And I was like, right, so I, I don't know what to do. And they're like, well, tomorrow's trash day, so why don't you wander around, see if anyone has an upholstered chair out there that you can use. There was a creative, definitely a creative process of, the, of budgeting where we were taught to, like, during fall, we wanted wood. You're, you had to go outside and listen for people that were getting trees cut down. You're like, and then go ask the guy, can I have this stump? Can I have, what are you doing with this stump? Can you help me get it in the car? <laughs> but it was, it was fun. And it's, we definitely learned to go seek out the materials for free. And not because we didn't have budget, but because it was also like we didn't know what we wanted to do yet. So the idea just came to us and like, just go hunt for it. Or trash day was a very big day. We've always been scrappy, but I feel like we're more creative when we have to be scrappy. Like if you had a million dollars, you could be like, yeah, I can make something cool for a million dollars. But when they're like, no, you have $21, you're like, okay. Yeah, I think that <laughs> goes back to your out. question about what makes a good display coordinator is scrappiness. <laughs> And I think um, through the book, you, you'll see that um, from the very beginning, our first store in Wayne, um, that the, the things that they chose to do to make that store special um, and the natural elements and sort of the, the vignettes and going from outside to inside, those all sort of, those are kind of tenets that stay with anthropology through the whole book. And you can see that there's just a, um, it's an aesthetic that even though it's changed and become more modern, there's just something about that's a respect for nature, it's a respect for elements, it's like the composition and the craft, um, it, the incredible detail of, of craft. There's, there's never anything that's sloppy, ever. <laughs> and you can see it through the book. It, it's pretty amazing. The display behind you of all the paintbrushes, that's a paintbrush that was sent to us from the display artist in every one of our stores. And we would not be the brand that we are without the artists we have in every single one of our locations who create these incredible environments for our customers. So um, I love that moment because it just, you know, again, it celebrates the fact that we're an, a huge group of talented people who are just constantly, you know, partnering and working together. So. I think that's a beautiful way to wrap things up. Um, everyone, thank you, for hosting. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, we'll all be mingling, so if you want to come talk or ask Erica what a fax machine is, um, <laughs> she'll be here. Um, let's have some drinks and some Showing bites. Showing my age, that's yeah. bad. I know what it is. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming.